Right, so to start off today, I've got a couple of objects here for you to take a look at. I'm not going to pass them around. Man, if my wife knew I brought this, she's not here today. This is a punch bowl. And it belonged to, my wife is Amber, it belonged to her great-grandmother. And her, my wife is German, mostly German in her ancestry. And this punch bowl on the bottom of it, which I will not show you or try to lift up and look at, um, it says made in, not Germany, but West Germany. Made in West Germany. It's pretty cool. Now, so that's the punch bowl. That's great grandma's punch bowl. I don't know a great grandma in, in German. I don't know what that is. All right, now this, I got to be real careful with this guy. This is Willie. And Willie, his arm is detached today. His arm has fallen off probably 10 times. I don't know. I keep gluing it back and it doesn't stay. Uh, so that's okay. Willie is old and he breaks often. Uh, Willie is a smoker. And uh, you, you open him up. That's why I got to kind of hold him together here. But if you take Willie apart, he comes right apart. That's why his arm breaks. He falls apart really easily. Um, you take Willie apart. Or no, I guess it's just on the bottom, so I won't drop his head off. On the bottom, there's a little tag, a little sticker that says, Made in the GDR. What's the GDR? Well, that's, that's East Germany. That is the German Democratic Republic, which was not democratic or a republic. East Germany and West Germany. We're talking about today the message, the title for today, and this is a part one of two. Within this series, we're looking at the grace-fueled life in the book of Ephesians, and today the title of the message is Bringing Down the Walls. Bringing Down the Walls. So let's talk about, for a moment, East Germany and West Germany. Let's talk about the Berlin Wall for a minute. Uh, now, most of you will remember this vividly, uh, but there are many of us here who might, might not know a lot about this because the Berlin Wall came down in 1989. And as weird as that sounds to those of us for whom 1989 was just a few weeks ago, uh, 1989 was actually a long time ago now. This has been down for a long time. But what we're looking at here is that the city of Berlin was divided. That's the backstory. Um, after World War II, uh, there was, you know, part of Germany was taken over by the Soviet bloc, um, the USSR, and part of it was still controlled by the Western allies. And so the country became divided into East and West Germany. Uh, East Germany was never recognized as a country by the West. Uh, and the city of Berlin itself, which was entirely inside of East Germany, the city was divided. At first, there was no physical boundary, but as things got worse and worse in the communist-controlled areas, people started to just leave East Germany by walking across the city of Berlin to the west. And by 1953, there were over 200,000 people a year just abandoning their life in the east and walking across to the West to start a new life. And so the communist regimes responded to that by building a wall in the middle of the city of Berlin. And this is the wall. You can see it here. Uh, as time went on, the wall on the West German side was painted in graffiti. And on the East German side, this was what was known as the death strip. The death strip. And that's because if you tried to run across it, they would shoot you. They had orders not necessarily to kill anyone who tried to cross, but definitely to shoot them. And if they died, well, that's what happened to them if they tried to get out. So the next picture, this is a very poignant image. This is in 1961 as the Berlin Wall was going up. So you can see they built sort of a low wall first and put some barbed wire, and then they kept on improving it. And this is a picture of a few West Germans, young West Germans, looking across the wall, and they are actually waiting to see if they're going to be able to connect with their relatives who have now been divided from them by a permanent wall. Do you imagine somebody put up a wall in the middle of Surrey, and you had relatives on the other side, and you, could, you just didn't know if you were ever going to see them again? 
You didn't know what was going to happen in that side. All of a sudden, that side was controlled uh, by really evil forces. So here they are looking across the wall, wondering what's going to happen. This is a vivid illustration for us of some things that we've been talking about. Last week, in the message in Ephesians chapter 2, the first 10 verses, we talked about how Paul tells us we were dead in our sins and our trespasses. We were dead. We were trapped, in fact, almost as if we were behind a wall, kept there, not able to get out of the situation that we were in, trapped by the world, the ways of this world, which we always think we can resist. Oh yeah, I'm not affected by the ads that are on TV, but you really are. We always think we can resist it, but we are trapped by it in our own power. We were trapped by our flesh, our own bodies and minds. We are not able to fully control ourselves on our own. And we were trapped, in fact, by Satan, by an evil spiritual being who is out to destroy us. It's kind of like the situation that the East Germans, the East Berliners, found themselves in after 1961. They were trapped and they could not leave. They were trapped in a system that was getting worse and worse. Now, we also saw last week that things are much worse. The natural condition of people in this world is much worse than we often think it is. And that was the situation in East Germany as well. People didn't understand at first just how bad things were going to be under communist control. And in fact, many people thought things were great even while communist control went on. But for those, as time went on, more and more people's eyes were opened to just how bad that system was. And this is also the case for the whole world. Sin has got the whole world trapped Sin, the world, the flesh, and the devil has us trapped, and we are actually dead in it without Christ. And as time goes on, as history goes on, more and more people are waking up to that fact and wondering, how can I escape? How can I get out from behind this wall? Getting out from behind that wall in Germany, in Berlin, took immense feats of courage after 1961. Some people dug tunnels that went way underneath the wall. There's a group of 57 people that made it out through a tunnel in 1963, and the tunnel was discovered just a few hours after the last of them made it through. There were people who tried to run the border. Some people made it over. Some people were shot dead. Crazy things that people did to escape uh, I used to be actually in a church that had a lot of German ancestry. And this was in Vancouver, Ebenezer Baptist Church. I was a pastor, I was a pastor there for quite a while. And actually this German smoker is named Willie because I had a friend there who's now gone on to be with God. Uh, my friend's name was Willie. And he was one of these who had run, not across that wall, but he'd run across the border between East and West Germany and was really saved. He was stopped by East German soldiers, and they could have killed him or arrested him, and for some reason, as he sat there praying, they decided to just let him keep going. He made it out. So many stories like that of the amazing feats that people had to do to escape. Now, as history goes on, more and more people are waking up to the reality that that's what normal life is like. The situation in East Germany is actually not as bad. That physical situation is not nearly as bad as the spiritual situation that regular human beings are in, just naturally, in this world. We took a look last week at some evidence that that's true. We're not going to go over that again, but you can go back and look at that message online. There, there are ways that we can show that this is true, for sure. But the amazing truth we looked at last week is that grace overwhelms the world, the flesh, and the devil. You see, God loved us so much that he made a plan. He made a plan to bring down the walls. He made a plan to break the chains so that we could become free. That plan was to send his son Jesus into the world. 
Jesus died on the cross and he came back to life from the dead so that we could be forgiven. All we have to do is turn to him and ask him for help. Any human being now has a way out. It actually takes great boldness still to take that way out. Because you have to leave, you have to leave your old life behind. Coming back to life from the dead is a scary thing. You have to face the fact that you actually were dead. That you're not just okay the way you are naturally in this world. You have to face that reality. And then you have to turn and run from it. Run from it like someone bolting across that kill zone, that dead man zone between the wall and East Germany. Run from it like my friend Willie did as he sprinted through the forest trying to cross the border into West Germany. That's what it takes. It's an act of faith. You see it? That would take great faith that when you get to the other side, you're going to be okay. And so it takes great faith and that kind of intensity to turn from our old lives and run after Jesus in this new life. But his grace is there. His power is there to overwhelm these things that hold us. The East German guards will not stop you, metaphorically speaking. The world, the flesh, and the devil cannot hold you back from the new life because of Jesus' power, which is actually there. We talked about last week how this new life, once we enter into it, it's his. That last verse that we looked at, verse 10 in chapter 2, we were created by him, actually recreated, made new in him. We are his workmanship. And therefore, what we're made for is his purpose. Once we enter this new life, we live out his purposes. We live for him. And we used, last week, we used our buddy, we used our friend that we're using throughout this series as a good illustration of that. What's our friend's name again? Bohemond. Bohemond. And what are we going to do when Bohemond comes out? We got cheer for Bohemond. We got to give him. Okay, so this is Bohemond. Yeah, this is Bohemond the Barbarian, right? Bohemond the Barbarian. Remember the facts about him. He's in the first century. He is, he was fighting the Romans with all of his uh, crazy hordes of barbarians. And he lost big time. He thought he was going to win. They were going down. They had big muscles, big swords, big axes, fighting the Roman army. They got decimated. They couldn't understand why. Bohemond is lying half dead on the battlefield and one of the Roman officers comes and says, this guy looks like he has potential. We're going to choose him. We're going to nurse him back to health and we're going to make a Roman out of him. We're going to put him into the Roman army and teach him a whole new way of life. And so what we're looking at, the illustration that's helping us understand the book of Ephesians, the illustration is Bohemond the Barbarian becoming Bohemond the Centurion. All right? That process, that process is similar to, we're going to compare it to the process of going from our lives before, our life just in this world naturally, and becoming a follower of Jesus, becoming a believer, becoming a Christian. Okay, so here we are. Bohemond the Barbarian transforming into Bohemond the Centurion. And what we said last week is imagine... Imagine what that was like for him, especially coming from his culture. That culture in Northern Europe at the time was very much an honor culture. And when he was saved by these Romans, people who he had attacked and tried to kill, who he lost to, and then they saved him and nursed him back to health, well, the natural response in his culture was, you saved my life. My new life belongs to you. I will now serve the ones who saved me. And that should be our natural response once we have entered into this new life with Jesus. He has saved us. He's given us new life. We must live for him alone. We must live for him alone. Now, let's move into what Bohemond would have felt like. Because I want to present to you the idea that Bohemond, even though he's now been brought into the Roman army, remember remember some of the things that they did for him. They're training him in a new way of life. They've got to teach him all kinds of things, right? Like they got to teach him how to take a bath, 
right? Because you can't, that, that's, the, that's the first thing they did to him, I'm sure. Because those northern Europeans, the, the Celts, they did not bathe regularly, all right? This is where medieval Europe got it from. Like once a year, that was, you were really good at hygiene if you bathed once a year. Well, the Romans bathed every single day. Every day. And in fact, most of the high-level commanders, uh, upper-class Romans, bathed twice a day. And so you could imagine what these, these barbarians smelled like to the Romans. Not very good. So the very first thing that they did was they took Bohemond and they dunked him in water. They cleaned him up. That's a scary thing to do. He looks pretty tough. Same as baptism. That's the very first thing we do when you come to Christ, you're ready to give your life to him. We dunk in water to show that that's the first thing that's going to happen. You need to be cleaned up. You need to be cleaned up. So they're doing all these things. They gave him a position in the Roman army. It's a low position at first that they give to Bohemond. Uh, he can't command people yet because he has to have his, his view of the world changed. They gave him certain promises. They gave him abilities. Uh, they gave him uh, a little seal that all these soldiers were given that one day when they had served in the army long enough, this seal guaranteed that they would be given Roman citizenship and they would be given an inheritance, a piece of land. So they're given all these things. They're given weapons. They're given armor. They're given the ability to ask for help. So they're given a, a family unit or a team, a squad that they're going to live with. They're going to get to know. And those people, they're going to have their needs provided for them. It's a whole new way of life that Bohemond is entering into. But now imagine that you are him for a minute. I know, it's kind of hard to imagine having that big of muscles. But imagine that you are Bohemond for a minute. You grew up in this totally different place. You've now entered the Roman army. You have dedicated your life to serve Rome. You have the Roman clothes. You have the Roman weapons. You've learned how to take a bath. But everybody else in the Roman army, at least the majority of them, are not barbarians like you. They've been in that Roman army for a long time. They know how things work and you don't. How do you feel in that Roman army? I submit to you that you feel like an outsider. There would be a strong tendency for Bohemond to feel like, even though I look like a Roman soldier, I'm not really in. I'm not really part of this thing. I'm from the outside. And there would be a tendency for the Roman soldiers who had been there for a long time to look down on Bohemond. He's a second-class Roman soldier. Okay, we have to use him because we need more soldiers and we're trying to train these guys up. But he's not a real Roman soldier. He's not even Italian. He's really an outsider. This is how Bohemond must have felt. Let's look now at our verses, some of our first verses, and bring down the walls. And we're going to answer the question here, why do so many people feel like outsiders? We're going to read this, Ephesians chapter 2, starting at verse 11. Therefore, remember that formerly, you who are Gentiles by birth, and called uncircumcised by those who call themselves the circumcision which is done in the body by human hands. Remember that at that time, you were separate from Christ, excluded from citizenship in Israel, and foreigners to the covenants and the promise, without hope and without God in the world. What exactly is being said here? Let me tell you what happened. So this is a big, large scale. We're going to back up huge on the historical timeline here. What happened is that the whole world had turned away from God. God made the world. He made everyone in it. But everybody turned away from him. Things got so bad that God had to come up with a plan. And his plan was he started with one person who had enough faith to trust God and take a step. That person was Abraham. And he said, out of Abraham, I'm going to make a whole nation and so over thousands of years, he built a nation out of Abraham's descendants. And he made that nation separate from everyone else. 
he built actually very clear walls around that nation. Not physical walls, but the, the, uh, the rules that he gave to this nation separated them from the other people around them. They made this nation set apart. That's what the word holy means. He made this nation holy, different than everyone else around them. And over thousands of years of really hard lessons, this nation, back and forth and back and forth, trusting God, then not trusting him, then trusting him, then not trusting him, this one nation, which we call Israel, the Jewish nation, was prepared to receive the Son of God. They were prepared, not where, to the point where all of them would follow him, but to the point where many of them, Many of them, a high percentage of this nation, would receive Jesus and would begin to follow his teaching. And in fact, as this nation had grown, it became clear over time that they were different than other nations and other nations had started to want to become like them. It was clear that the things God was doing for them and the things that, that God had given them, the wisdom that God had given them, the promises that God had given them, these were giving them a kind of life that no one else in the world had. This became clear to the other nations around them. Many instances in the Bible of other nations going to the nation of Israel. How do you have all this wisdom? Where did it come from? How can we get it? In fact, there's this term in the Old Testament, the first part of the Bible, the term living God. We talked about uh, in one of our songs today, a living hope. The Jews, the nation of Israel, referred to their God as the living God. What they meant was, their God was the God who actually does things. Versus the gods of all the other nations, where the other nations pray to their gods, which were idols that they had created with their own hands. They pray to these other gods, and nothing happens. Or sometimes bad stuff happens. Whereas the nation of Israel, when they prayed to their God, they didn't always get everything they wanted. But it was very clear that their God was alive. He was doing things. And over the generations, the other nations began to notice that. And so, when you get to the time of Jesus, what had happened in the couple hundred years before Jesus was that many, many people in the Roman Empire, also in the East, in the Persian Empire, many, many people had a desire to have what the Jewish nation had. So you have all these people who became what we call God-fearers. People who were learning, trying to learn what the Jewish nation was doing so they could, they could somehow get closer to this God. But there was still a separation. There was still a way in which they weren't part of this nation ethnically. And so they were on the outside. Because of their cultures and their family backgrounds, they couldn't follow all the rules that God had given to the Jewish nation. And so they were still outsiders. They were second-class Jews. They weren't even really Jews. They were just people who wished they were. It was almost like the reverse of the image we saw earlier. We saw earlier those West Germans looking across into East Germany. It was almost like as if all of the East Germans had approached the wall. Now they couldn't because the guards were there and we might shoot them. But as if all the East Germans had approached the wall and were just looking across longingly, hoping, wishing that they could get across into a better place on the other side. That's what the world was like when Jesus showed up. And so we see in these verses that Paul is reminding a church the Apostle Paul who wrote this letter is reminding a church, the church in Ephesus, and he's reminding us that once we were outsiders, once we were without God, we were on the outside, we were separated from God. So let's answer this question, because even though maybe we haven't felt exactly this same way, maybe some of us have, that we were separated on the outside from God, many of us in this world today feel like outsiders. And the question, the first one to write down in your notes is this. Why do so many people feel like outsiders? Have you ever felt like an outsider in your life? Are you a person that that has been a major theme in your life? Feeling like an outsider in many different situations? I want to admit to you today that for me, this has been a regular, very common feeling in all the different stages of my life, in all kinds of different situations, that I have felt 
like an outsider, even when it makes no sense. I've often blamed it on my circumstances. I felt like an outsider growing up. I was born in California, and then I moved to Washington when I was very young. So I really grew up in Washington State. But my entire time growing up, I felt like I wasn't really from Washington. I felt like everybody else were really the insiders, the people who were from that place. I was really an outsider. I didn't belong there. Uh, my parents got divorced, and I used that as a reason. Well, I don't have two parents like most of the other people I know, although now that's changed for many people. It's more common maybe to not have two parents nowadays. But I felt like I don't have two, two biological parents at home, and so I feel like I'm separate from these people, like I'm an outsider. In school, I constantly felt like I was an outsider. I could give you all the reasons, but they really don't make any sense. Those schools that I was in, I was just as much a part of, as a part of them as anyone else, but I always felt like an outsider. I moved to Canada 15 years ago. I still feel like an outsider often in Canada. Does that make any sense? Am I an outsider? You're thinking, yeah, he's an American. He doesn't belong here. Why do I always feel like an outsider? Um, I felt like an outsider it, in the church often. I didn't grow up in church. Don't raise your hand, but have you ever felt like an outsider in the church among people who are followers of Jesus? I didn't grow up in the church, and so it took me a long time to understand the culture of churches, how things work. Things seemed really strange to me, especially at the beginning. But even still, sometimes, I feel like I'm a pastor, and I feel like an outsider in the church. I'll get together with a group of pastors, I'll feel like an outsider. This is a very common experience, outsider syndrome, all the way across the board for people in our world today. Why? because things are so bad, because things are worse than they used to, because people move around a lot? No. Here's the reason why outsider syndrome exists. I, I believe. We, those of us who feel like we're on the outside, it's not because of the circumstance that we're in at that moment. It's because deep down, human beings at a very deep level are divided from each other. There is massive division that exists in our world. Between you and the person sitting next to you, even if it's the closest person in the world to you, you are not united in the way that you were created to be united together. The world is divided deeply by sin, by Satan, by evil, by our own wrong desires. And we sense that in all kinds of different ways. We are deeply divided, and so we feel like outsiders much of the time. This is the reason. We see that right in the beginning of the Bible, Genesis chapter 3, as soon as human beings have turned away from God, there's all these divisions that come in. There's going to be divisions God promises in that section. He, he declares it as a result of the things that we've done, chosen to turn against him. There's going to be division between husbands and wives. Do you know that that's true? No matter what, there's going to be divisions between husbands and wives. There's going to be divisions between parents and children. We can work hard at making those things better, but it's always going to be true in this world to some degree. We can't escape it. And so outsider syndrome is a reality. And this is part of why we saw in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 10, we saw that the plan of God for all of history, here's the big thing that he's doing, Paul said he's going to reveal a mystery to us. Here's the big thing that he's doing. Why did Jesus die on the cross? So that we could have our sins forgiven. We could enter a new life with God. What is the end goal of all that? Is to unite. To unite everything, everyone in heaven and on earth in Christ. Everyone and everything is going to be brought back together. Everyone who's willing to turn and follow after him are going to be brought back into complete unity. Let's carry on now in Ephesians chapter 2 and look at the next verses that we see here. Verses 13 and following. We were divided. We were without God. That's what he's just said. We were separated from God and from God's people, but... 
now in Christ Jesus, you who were once far away have been brought near by the blood of Christ. By his blood, you are brought in. For he himself is our peace. He has made the two groups one, and he has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility. The things that separate human beings, he has brought it down. The thing that's bigger than the wall that was in east, between East and West Berlin, he has brought it down. By setting aside in his flesh, that is in Jesus' own body as he died on the cross, he set aside the law with its commands and regulations. His purpose was to create in himself one new humanity out of the two, thus making peace. And in one body, his body, to reconcile both of them to God through the cross, by which he put to death their hostility. He came and preached peace to you who were far away and peace to those who were near. For through him, we both have access to the Father by one spirit. Consequently, as a result, you are no longer foreigners and strangers, but you are fellow citizens with God's people and you are members of his household. You are fellow citizens with God's people and members of his household, built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. In him, the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. And in him, you too are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his Holy Spirit. Wow, that was a lot right there. Here's the point. The walls are now down, and you are in. If you have given your life to God through his son Jesus, if you have asked him to forgive your sin, and you've said, I want you to have control of my life, not me anymore, then you are in. The walls between you and God and the walls between actually you and other people, as you move, as you move together toward God, between you and especially other believers, those walls have been destroyed. They are gone. You are in. Hmm. How can we know that we're in when we don't feel like we are? The way that Paul says we can know it in this verse, in these verses, is by the Holy Spirit active in our lives. We can know that we are in. Let's go back to the example of Bohemond again. Remember he's sitting there. He's feeling like he looks like a Roman soldier. He's got the tools. He's, he's got the position, but he feels like he's not really on the inside. That's kind of like us. That's kind of like many of us who have maybe have given our lives to Jesus. We've come into the church, but maybe like Pastor Isaac, you still feel like you're not really part of this family. You hear me get up here and talk about how we are one. All of us who have given our lives to Jesus, we are one. We're united. We are a family. We are a team. We are deeply one together in Christ, but you don't feel like that. You maybe feel like you don't have any friends like you don't belong, like you don't really know people. Hopefully you don't feel like that, but I know that many of you do, even among this group, even among our own church. You are like Bohemond. He's sitting there in the Roman army, and maybe you even feel divided from God. You feel like, well, maybe I'm not, maybe it's those other people who look like they really have their life all together. They've been followers of Jesus since they were little kids, and I feel like I'm on the outside. I'm not... Maybe God doesn't like me as much as he likes them. You know that doesn't make sense, but maybe that's how you feel. Maybe God's going to answer their prayers, but not mine. I'm not really worthy to be part of this. You are just like Bohemond. And what does Bohemond need to do in his situation? He needs to remember that he really is part of the Roman army. He needs to remember the evidence that he is. What is the evidence? The evidence is everything that he's been given. 
The evidence is the fact that he can go to his commanding officer and he can make a request. He can say, I need help in this particular area of the battle and help arrives. And that evidence is the same for you. It is the evidence of a grace-fueled life. You maybe don't feel like you're on the inside, but if you have given your life to Jesus, the Holy Spirit, God himself, is living inside of you. God himself is listening to you when you ask him for help. And if you will go to him, if you will go to him and ask, he will show up and do things in your life. And when he does, you're going to recognize in those moments, you're going to see, your eyes will be opened and you'll see, I really am on the inside. I really am in. The walls are down. I can see it because the Holy Spirit is doing things in my life. You can also see it even when you don't ask God for help. Even when you don't, Bohemond might not go to his commanding officers for help, but guess what? They are coming to him and telling him things that he has to do. If you are a follower of Jesus, here's what's happening in your life. God is trying to get you to go a certain direction. He is doing things in your life. He is speaking to you in lots of different ways. The question is, are you listening? Are you paying attention to what he's saying? He is even disciplining you, doing things that sometimes you don't like in your life that are painful in order to help you turn and go the right way. What Bohemond needs to do is to recognize that when his commanding officers discipline him, that's because he's part of the army. He's on the inside. They're trying to train him to get him to where he needs to be. And that's what's happening in your life too. God is trying to help you get to where you need to be. God at work in your life, that's the grace-fueled life. And that is evidence that you are really on the inside. Here's one more thing Bohemond could do. He could go and reach out to his fellow soldiers. He could go spend time with them. They are a family. And maybe even though he thinks they don't like him, and maybe some of them don't, a lot of the reason he feels divided from them is just inside himself. And he needs to reach out and spend time with them and develop his relationship. He really is one with them in the army. But he doesn't feel like it, and he's not walking in that. For many of you, this is just like you. You really are one with all these other people sitting around you in Christ. But you don't feel like it, and you're not walking in it. That's what we need to do. We need to walk in our unity in Christ. This is what he's calling us to. The walls are down and you are in. I'm going to have one more point. But before we get to the last point, I'm going to give you a couple of ways that you could put what we've heard so far into practice if you decided to. Remember that how useful is it to come on Sunday morning, listen to a message, and then go home and do nothing with it? How useful is that? It is zero. It is zero useful. That's the amount of usefulness that that is. So when you come on Sunday morning, you've done a good thing, but if you don't follow it through on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, it's useless. So don't think that by coming and listening to this message, or those of you listening online, don't think you've checked the box and you're done, because it won't bear any fruit in your life unless you put it into practice. So here's a couple of ways that you could put what we've heard so far into practice if you decide to. It's up to you, not up to me. If you feel like you are an outsider, maybe at work, maybe in your biological family, maybe in British Columbia, in Canada, maybe in the church, if you feel like you're an outsider, come all the way in. If you feel like you're an outsider with God, Come all the way in. Do what I've just described that Bohemond needs to do and take those steps to come all the way in because the truth is, if you see the evidence of the Holy Spirit active in your life, then you are in. The walls are down and you are on the inside already. What you need to do is walk in it. A second thing that you could do with this is to help someone else come all the way in. 
Maybe today, after this message, or even right now, you look around and you think, actually, I, I feel like I'm all the way in. I feel like this is my family. But I see that there are people here who don't feel that way. I see it. What would happen if one of Bohemond's friends in his squad in the Roman army came to him and drew him in? When I was first a Christian, I had a, a close, he became my close friend, buddy named Matthew. And people would invite me to things. People would invite me to come to something at church. Oh, I'd say no. I'd just stay in my room uh, in my university. I became a Christian in university. My friend Matthew, he came to my door and invited me almost every day for like three months before I said yes to him. Because in my heart and mind, I felt like I was separate from all those other people. I felt like I wasn't part of their thing. And I had this barrier, even though the barrier wasn't really there. Because Jesus had torn it down, my friend Matthew did what was necessary to draw me in, to bring down that wall. Those are two things, two ways that you could put this into practice today. Okay, now for the last point. We've said that the walls are down. We've said that Jesus brought them down, the walls between us and God, and the walls between people. If two people have come to God, they're alive in Christ, they've given their lives to him, then the walls between them are down, they're gone. Jesus has already destroyed them. That's what we saw Paul say. Well, then why do I feel so divided from everybody else? If that's true. If it's true that the walls are down, why do I still so often feel separated from God? Why do I feel far from him if the walls are down? Why do I feel separated from other people, even the people who are closest to me? Why do I always feel like an outsider in almost every situation that I'm in if the walls have really been destroyed? This is the Berlin Wall in 1988. The Berlin Wall came down in 1989. In 1988, you can see the west side of the wall, it's almost like the wall is a joke at this point. They've decorated it, all these wonderful colors. They've spray painted slogans on it. You can see people in their totally 80s get up, just wandering by it in the sunshine, kind of laughing at the wall. Like this is ridiculous, the thing is, this thing is still even here. The political will for that wall to be up, actually was already destroyed in 1988. The tone of the entire world had become, the wall shouldn't exist. And the political will, even in the Soviet bloc, to keep that wall up had disintegrated. And yet the wall was still there. You know what this says? Can anybody read this? Somebody in this room can read this. This, this big... Anybody tell what it says? It says, Berlin will be wall-free. It had even been declared, just like Paul declared, the walls are down. It was declared in huge letters on the wall, this wall is gone. And the wall was still there. What was it waiting for? It was waiting for 1989. The wall was already gone in people's minds, in political reality, but it was still there physically. What was it waiting for? It was literally waiting for someone to pick up a hammer. In 1989, a bunch of people got riled up in, on the west side of Berlin and somebody grabbed a sledgehammer and walked out to the wall and hit it. And you would think that's not gonna do anything. One person hitting the wall with a sledgehammer, but the wall was really already gone. And so when they hit that wall, people started flooding to the wall with hammers. And they tore that sucker down. And imagine what it was like to be in Berlin in those days. It was like life from the dead. Here's the last question I'm going to leave you with. Why are the walls still up? Who's got a hammer? 